All right, let's uh, finish up this uh, section on the courts by talking about the Nevada courts uh, with a particular emphasis here on the Nevada Supreme Court. So in terms of the basic structure of, of state courts in Nevada, we have at the very apex of that uh, hierarchy, the Nevada Supreme Court. It's a seven-member court. Uh, we have below that now the Nevada Court of Appeals, just approved uh, in uh, 2014 by the, the voters of Nevada. So for the first time, we will now have an intermediate court of appeals. And then below that, the many, many uh, district courts, uh, local trial courts, basically. Um, all right. And in fact, if you wanted to get a little closer look at how those district courts uh, are spread around the state, most of them uh, obviously are in uh, the Las Vegas Valley, Clark County. You can check out that, uh, that web link there. All right. So issues that we might want to talk about here. Uh, the Nevada Supreme Court is a, uh, an, a, an, a, uh, an elected, nonpartisan elections, right? Nonpartisan elections are how we choose the membership of the Nevada Supreme Court and going forward, the Nevada Court of Appeals. Um, nonpartisan, you know, there's a history of that. It goes back to the progressive era, the early, uh, early 20th century. Uh, these are common in the West. East Coast, you're much more likely to have partisan elections for judicial seats. Um, I get it, right? I get it. The idea being that judges should be above politics, but we know from our discussions of the Supreme Court of, of the U.S. that you know, judges and justices are not above uh, politics. And so when we have, in my view, these nonpartisan elections, it uh, eliminates a crucial source of information for we the people. So it can be hard to know for whom to vote, uh, given that these elections are nonpartisan. <clears throat> and we know that their, their politics do matter. So that's one thing that we might uh, uh, point out here. Uh, some also question whether or not we should elect the judges at the highest level here. Um, or at the federal level, we do, do not do that. Should, should we do it at the state level? Uh, it's very common. I believe uh, in the vast majority of states, that is how it's done. Uh, but some would question if we, the people, have the requisite information. Uh, these tend to be low information elections. Uh, the candidates don't have a partisan label. Uh, there's a lot of things they're not allowed to say under various codes of judicial ethics. Uh, some would argue that uh, making this an elected position is perhaps not fantastic. But it is what it is. And there's, there's alternatives that some states use, uh, uh, putting more power in the hands of the governor to, uh, to nominate these people, perhaps with some role, some role for the state senate. Some believe we should have it done through these judicial commissions. Uh, I would say this, though. The evidence is that you, the, the quality of the judges don't seem to vary from one state to the next, regardless of their exact selection technique, be it elections, partisan or nonpartisan, be it a judicial commission, be it gubernatorial appointment. Uh, one issue, though, right, with elections for judicial seats is that uh, these candidates for these positions do solicit campaign contributions. Uh, they get them from law firms, they get them from corporations, who then may ultimately appear before these judges down the line. So many would say, it looks like justice for sale. Uh, there are certainly significant questions about that. Uh, some would say, at the very least, the appearance of impropriety. Uh, some would say, at worst, perhaps even the, uh, the, uh, the actual substance of impropriety. That's a definite issue. Some believe that public funding of these elections would be better. Elections, if you want to keep them, make them publicly funded um, to take away some of those uh, ethical questions about uh, campaign contributions. Uh, also worth noting here, these are elected positions at the Nevada Supreme Court and now the appellate court level and, and of course the district court slash local court level. Uh, now what happens uh, is that when there are openings, when somebody leaves the court before the end of their term and they are... Uh, what are those? For the Nevada Supreme Court, it's six-year terms. Uh, if, if a judge leaves before the end of that term, which is pretty common, uh, the governor gets to nominate somebody to fill that position, and I believe an election has to be held within a year of that appointment. So uh, an awful lot of the judges ultimately begin that journey onto the uh, judicial system, into the judicial system, uh, via gubernatorial appointment. So that's not, not uh, something, it's not it's not immediately apparent, but it's something that, that uh, reflects how the, the system actually works. An awful lot of these judges start out via gubernatorial appointments. Although technically we are, uh, it is an elected position, many start out as a gubernatorial appointee. 
And typically these appointees, the incumbents, almost always win uh, when it comes time for that uh, first election. So in that sense, uh, the, the elections in many cases become a rubber stamp of a gubernatorial appointment. And also what's happened now that we do have a Nevada Court of Appeals um, to handle the heavy caseload of the Nevada Supreme Court, which was up to, I think, 300 cases a year, which is ridiculous that they had to hear. And so the Court of Appeals will help with that. How, how do these initial uh, judges get onto the court? I'll post a link here for that. Uh, they get on initially via gubernatorial appointment uh, with some role played initially by a judicial commission uh, that comes up with candidates. Uh, so again, do not underestimate the significance of gubernatorial appointment for Nevada's uh, judicial system. All right. Um, I think that's really, uh, that's what I wanted to say. So uh, I think with that, we'll be moving on now. Next section of the course before exam number three, public opinion.